for the younger brothers that just convert, converted to Islam. Welcome. The problem is today is like a very heavy class, man. So <laughs> it's it's not really it's going to break your head and break your mind. So you don't have to stay because it will be maybe a bit too much. Yeah, are you okay? Um, I would like to teach something else, really, uh, like uh, the basic principles and, and so forth. Uh, why don't you come a bit closer uh, to both of you, uh, What's your name, brother? Matteo, a beautiful name. Matteo and Gabriel. Mashallah, nice to meet you. Um, how old are you, Matteo? Every time they come becoming younger, huh? he's 17, you're 15. When I, when I compared to Islam, I was 18. So subhanAllah, you all are catching up with me. Good. Mashallah. What, what made you... Everybody will ask you that question, so I'm so sorry. But what... what What's the drive with the easy? Okay. playing basketball with the friends and yeah, with a lot of background music. Um, I wasn't thinking about that. So congratulations. Gabriel, you too. So so the advice what I would like to give you is just take it easy and just go on your own terms. I don't mean not on the terms of Allah. But don't let people pull, push, convince, whatever. You know how strong you are, you know how ready you are. So nobody has to come and judge you because you are not doing something they think you should be doing. You are Muslim, take it easy. The first thing that a Muslim does is, is being happy. Huh? Being Muslim is about being happy. It's about loving life, loving your parents, loving nature, loving the people, loving your food, your health, your wealth. And it's, it's gradually, gradually growing into, into it. Assalamu alaikum. And um, so I think so as I see it now, I think um, we have, have had so many converts. Um, I should have started in September with a group of youngsters, remember? But um, apparently it's not happening yet, and not, not because of me. We should start a group of converts, and right? just teaching converts. And then maybe you may, the group I wanted to teach, they can teach themselves. But I think we should start a group of converts. So let us let us do this inshallah. I, I already know what, what I would like to teach you. It would be just the names of Allah, getting to know Allah, and how to worship Allah, which would be fiqh and the names, divine names. And then we can do that inshallah. Uh, which doesn't mean we're not gonna do your plan. So you have to ask the Muslims to come also. Khalas, would you would you like that? Yeah. Okay, good. So then we have to gather the converts. You can call it convert rebirth, whatever you want to call it. I'm not too bothered with the terms. MashaAllah. So it's good. You know, the, the Prophet sallallahu do you know that he had four braids in his head? Yeah. Yeah, braids. Braids, yeah. <laughs> like in the front and two in the back. So you will have people tell you, ah, you're a Muslim, you're not allowed to eat. Hold your horses, man. This is halal. You know? People, they come with so many stuff, they just... It's like they make stuff up on the spot. Just the yes. Yeah. So, as I said, don't let anyone fool you. You've got, if you have scholars or an imam that you can trust in the mosque, that's your only point of reference. So don't try to go on the internet. You will find thousand things. They're not all correct, even if people think they are. Just come to people. You say, I've got this question. I've got an issue. What should I do? Don't go online. Online is filled with a lot of rubbish. So you just you can come to me, the other imams that are here, whatever. We will always make time for you. Allah? Okay. So 
the VR conference. Are there any other conference here? Just three of us. Yeah, you, you convert pounds to dollars. Let's go for it. It's quite a أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأصلي وأسلم على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين With the will of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Today we are going to explore why we sometimes feel so attracted to the afterlife and sometimes so attracted by the worldly life Why sometimes we feel that we have two personalities Like we feel attracted to hasanat, to good doing good deeds and then all of a sudden we feel attracted to doing bad ones and sometimes we feel that we have like two things living in one and in reality that's not the truth we are one so what's going on from where does that come what is happening to us and very often it looks like we want something but we can't make it happen like we, we feel I want to wake up in the morning to pray to God Almighty Allah but then I just end up sleeping I say, I'm going to lower my gaze and never watch something I shouldn't be watching. And then before I know it, I walk around the face of the earth with a feeling of guilt because I did it again. I feel that I want to respect my parents and I really, really, really regret the times that I've been yelling at them and raising my voice. And then before I know it, there I go again. So what is happening? So we, we have these two extremes, as it were. So that, that means that we have to look at the nafs and at the ruh. We have to look at the nafs and the ruh. The ruh very often called the ego, or called the, the nafs very often called the ego, or called the carnal self, the low self, and the ruh, the soul. And then people actually think, imagine that this bottle would be divided in two on the inside. So the bottle would be divided on the inside. On one side you would have water, and on the other side you would have juice. And then you would have two, yani two openings where you can drink from. So if you drink from here, you have juice. You drink from there, you have water. That is how a lot of people imagine the soul and the ruh to coexist in the body. So they think that the ruh and the soul or the ruh, the ruh and the nafs are two separate, different entities that live within the same vessel. Are you with me? Okay. So that is how they, that is how they, they perceive the ruh and they perceive the ego. So they say the ego is me and the ruh is something inside of me and they do not really know how to explain it. Now before we carry on, it's important to know that the scholars of old, they were working with the tools they had. Now meaning that they were approaching the Islamic and, and, and religious texts from their perspective and they were limited by the science that was out there and then. What do I mean? When you look into the madhab, yani into one of the madhahib of 1,200 years ago, then you will see that they said that a woman could be pregnant for a year and a half. We all know that's impossible, right? A year and a half, it just doesn't exist. The child will die and so will the mother. I mean, it's impossible. Nevertheless, the verdict was given that a woman can be pregnant for a year and a, for a year and a half. We know it's impossible. So why did they say this? Now we see that science found out that when a woman really desires a child that she can have the symptoms of a pregnant woman meaning that all of a sudden she will she she feel, feels nauseous she has headaches she has back aches um, and, and, and maybe even her hormones cause her belly to swell so people will think oh she's pregnant but it's no more than her body answering to what she really wants are you still with me so now she is like that and then all of a sudden after, let us say, nine months, she really becomes pregnant. So people on the outside think she was pregnant for a year and a half. Nine and nine is not a year and a half, it doesn't matter. Now, so she was pregnant for a year and a half. 
because they didn't have the, the tools to investigate and to look inside of the body like we have today. So if today you were going to give the fatwa, a woman can be pregnant for a year and a half, we're going to say you're out of your mind. That's impossible. So we see that the scholars of old, with all due respect, and we have to respect them, they were putting effort in finding solutions to problems and answers to questions in the light of the knowledge they had back there and then. Khalas? So, but as yani, things went on, Allah Jalla wa Ala yani, gave us tools to find out many things that they were not able to find out or to look at or to observe or to know, which is not a disgrace. They were very intellectual scholars, but they didn't have the tools. So now when we look at yani, the nafs and we look at, or the ego and we look at the ruh, what are they? What are they? So we have to go back in time, as we did yani, previously, not here, but in one of my previous classes, so bear with me. So we, we know that the soul was created before the body. We agree? The soul was created before the body. So we had an existence before our existence on the face of the earth. We all stood as souls in front of the Almighty. With the proof that Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Alastu bi Rabbikum. Yani that Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says in the Quran, Ashhadahum ala anfusihim, Alastu bi Rabbikum. He made them bear witness against themselves, Am I then not, not your Lord? So you stood there in front of Allah as a soul, not, not as a body. And everybody gazed upon Allah Jalla wa Ala, looking at Allah, and He said, Am I your Lord? And you said, Yes, you are. And then we remained in the world of souls and we do not remember what happened there. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad said, like Al Arwah Jundul Mujannada or Junudul Mujannada. The Arwah are troops that are being gathered again. Meaning that the souls that used to know each other before being invited to the face of the earth and that get to know each other, like you know me, I know you. We are in contact with one another. The core reason for this is that we have met before. We have met, Jazakallah khairan, in the world of souls. And that is why people say, it looks like I've known you forever. It is because you have. We were just separated for a certain amount of time, but then our paths crossed again. And it looks like, subhanAllah, and that's why they say that you're soulmate. That is why people speak of a soulmate. Now, does it exist? It exists. According to the scholars, it means that you were two souls that were united and that Allah split in two. Now, the, yeah, yeah, split in two and then like a magnet, they were destined to find each other again. So that's what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. Ma the souls that knew each other then will find each other now. But it was erased from our, from our what? From our memory. Now, from our heart disk, because it would be too easy if you remember that you stood in front of Allah, then life wouldn't have been a test, would it? Yani, you're just born and, oh yeah, I remember that Allah exists. So that is not how it happened. So we were souls. Now we have three in intangible bodies, yani, or beings, three beings without a body. The jinn, the malaika, and the ruh. Jinn, malaika, ruh. The jinn of smokeless fire. The angels like the Prophet ﷺ said, created out of light. And the ruh, yani something which is not tangible, no? it's transparent. So there were three beings that had no body. And Allah chose one of these three beings to reside within that physical body that He would create for it. Because He wanted to be worshipped in the world of, of bodies, not in the world of souls, like the angels for example. So that's where he designed the body for Adam, but the soul already existed. So he created his body out of clay, and then Jibreel, Ali, Jibreel alayhi, alayhi yani he would circumambulate nam, the body of Adam, and he would sniff, what is this? And then he said, nothing good will come from this one. He has too many holes. What does that mean? He can hear. He can smell, he can talk, he can use his private parts for something bad. 
So he knew that Adam had a lot of entrances and exit points that would not lead to, to many good things. So he was walking around him, around him, around him, and he said, nothing good will come from this. So he was already arrogant before he refused to bow for Adam. So then Allah Jalla wa'ala chose from the three bodiless beings, Ruh, Jinn, Malaika, or Malak, he chose the Ruh. And that's where Allah Jalla wa'ala said to everybody then, فَإِذَا نَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ And when I blow my ruh, not my ruh, and the ruh I had created, into his body, then prostrate for him. Why? Out of honor for the soul within. Because back in the days, yani people were allowed to prostrate for others. Like the, the brothers of Yusuf for Yusuf. Because that before Islam, yani before the Prophet Islam, it was a form of greeting and respect. So it was not a form of worship. So, yani All of the angels then prostrated for Adam. Are you still with me? Or do we have to change this again? We have to change it? I think we should have like three buttons and that we, that we know in advance which one. Are we good now? Yes? Okay. So, we continue. So Allah Jalla wa Ala, He said, فَإِذَا نَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ When I have blown my ruh into him, then all prostrate for him. So all the angels prostrate. They didn't prostrate for the physical body. He said, when I blow the ruh into that body, it's then that you prostrate. Because the essence is not the body. The essence is the soul within. And that's where Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." We have honored mankind, humankind. How? By telling the most, or ordering and commanding the most pure of creation, the angels, to prostrate for the soul. This is how honored you are. Allah has designed a world of angels that is at your service in Jannah in Dunya. Now they have been given the task to serve you, not to worship you, to serve you. You have some angels writing, some protect you by the grace of Allah in the will of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Others that do so many different things that protect you when you sleep, that do istighfar for you when they go around the arsh. So this most beautiful creature, which is the angel, who is not guilty of any sin has been destined to work for you. Can you imagine? Swala, it's like I hear myself three times. Is that okay? Is, does it disturb you or is it okay? No. So now, where does the story go now? So we were in the, we were in the world of souls. Now I'm like the Prophet Ali said. And then Allah Jalla wa Hala wanted that soul to worship him in the physical world. And the only being that was strong enough to do this was the soul. The soul was the only being strong enough to resist the carnal self, the physical self, with all, it, with all it, what its wants and its needs, not its passions and desires, deviant or not. So it was very, the basic instincts and emotions that are all a part of that survival mechanism that Allah has created. Now that is what you feel. When all of a sudden you have that drive, Something is propelling you, something is thriving you, something is driving you. And, and then you say, what is that force? What is that power? It is just that body, an untamed beast, as it were. Like if you now were to jump into Hamilton, Hamilton's uh, F1 car, you would not be able to tame it. You jump on a, I don't know, three, uh, 2000 cc, you just go like this, boom, you're gone. You can't tame it. So sometimes we can't resist that body, but we will learn inshallah today and next time how we can. So now to come back, Allah created that tank that was destined to survive, that was destined to self-heal. Ajeeb. Yani we talk about aliens, like you see in movies and all of a sudden they heal again. That's you. I'm not saying you're an alien. Huh? So, so that's you. You have a scar and then if you film it, you fast forward it, you see yourself healed. 
So now Allah created that tank which is a body which is not, which doesn't live without the soul. It doesn't live without the soul because the soul is its owner, is it, it's, its tamer, it tames the body. So now Allah Jalla Ala, He said like everybody will have a body, every soul. And it will be like your horse that you will use to gallop, figuratively speaking, towards me. You will use it, you will oil it, you will take care of it because it is destined to survive because I want you to live as long as you can to worship me. So that body has to be strong. It has to, subhanAllah, yani when you, 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 you drive the same car for five years and you don't change your tires, you've got a problem, my friend. Did you ever change your skin? Did you ever change your kidneys, your heart, your lungs? There is no apparatus in, in the world that, that survives as long as the human body. Our skin renews as we speak. Now, but it, so Allah designed that for us. And one of the things that He gave to us was that limbic system that is within the brain. And it, that part in the brain that is pure emotional, that's pure survival, that a part that you have no control over, it happens. Because it says, I have to survive. I'm in flight, fight, freeze modus right now. We're going back to that. I just want you to look. So you have that gentle, transparent, pure, uh, for the Lord longing soul in that carnal self that wants nothing to survive. And surviving is by two things. Now I'm surviving is by making sure that you survive and that you survive through the people after you. Now that you recreate yourself, meaning the sexual drive. Now that, that's the system that we have. We, do you, are you still with me? Are you still with me? Okay. So, it's a bit... Uh, so, you have the soul now. Now Allah, like you would think that you have that, how do you call it, line work? You say, uh, the conveyor belt, or how do you call it? When people work like one thing, all the thing, how do you call it? Huh? Conveyor belt. So, <laughs> the souls were all waiting to descend from the skies into a body. But you existed before your body. And that's why you only descended in your body when, you, when the, that body was four months old. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. عن عبد الله مسعود رضي الله عنه أخبرنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هو صادق المصدوق إن أحدكم etc. So he said, the Prophet ﷺ said that first you are this, then you are that, and after 120 days, يرسل إليه الملك. The 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 angel is sent. فينفق فيه الروح. And he blows the ruh into that body that was created for you. So it is not, not the body that was given a soul. It was the soul that was given a body. Ah, are you with me? It was, it, it, the, it's not the same, is it? The body, nam, the soul was given a body. A body was being prepared for the soul as she was waiting to descend from the skies into that body. And not the body that was given a soul. Because that would mean that the body was there before the soul, and that is not the case. So when we talk about the true you, we actually talk about the ancient self within you. You, my friend, you're not 20. You're not 15 or 17 or 30 or 40 or 47 like myself. That is not how young or old you are. That is how old the vehicle is that you are allowed to use as a soul to travel towards Allah in a physical way. But the you, the real you, is the one within. The ancient self. And we don't believe in reincarnation. So we're not, being, we're not saying we're being reincarnated. No. Our, the soul was existing. It goes through different phases. Not in different stages. Like it will go from this body to a new body in the hereafter. And then it will go to Jannah or it will go to now. May Allah Jalla wa'ala protect us. So now you see that body comes down or that soul comes down in that body. Now, the thing is when that soul now entered into the body, it was restricted and confined and limited for the first time in its life. Before it would speak without tongues. It would move without body. It would have no passion or desire apart from Allah. And that sometimes as you will see, all of a sudden that craving for something more, that craving to, to, to be with Allah, that is the soul you feel within. 
Now, so that soul within all of a sudden comes to the surface again. And that's the true you, that is you. So what is the problem? Where did we go wrong? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. So we enter into that body and now the soul is in a body that she needs to control, that she needs to ride, that she needs to tame. So now she, at the very beginning, that body is only like nine months old. And the soul within is ancient. She wants to speak about her Lord, she can't. She wants to share what, where she came from, she can't. Exactly, she needs to learn how to use the body. She needs to learn how to walk with the body, how to talk with the body. And before she knows it, her, the body she resides in was nourished more than her soul. And the environment was all about the physical and not about the spiritual. So the soul got disconnected from where she once came from and the body, that armor, overtook and ruled over her. Are you still with me? So now, if we have a look, we have that part in our body which is called brain. You know, and people always say, ah, psychology, neuroscience, all these things, they are not a part of Islam and this and that. Who are you to say this anyway? I mean, Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the Quran, wa fi anfusikum alafatu sirun. And there are signs in your bodies, in your own selves. Do you then not see? Knowing how the brain works, knowing how your eyes work, knowing how your thinking works, your rationale, your everything, that just increases your faith. The one, yani, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ says Allah, are those who know and those who do not know, are they equal, are they similar, are, are they leveling? No, they are not. And it's not only ilm al-shar'i, it is not only religious sciences. And now I have to add this so that you do not think that I'm freestyling because I don't like traditional sciences. My PhD is in Islamic sciences. So it's not that I say, okay, I don't like it, I don't want, no, no. But I believe in a holistic approach where we look at ourselves through all the different lenses and only then it will work. Only then will you grow spiritually if you know your body, your environment, your mind, your soul, because we are more than just a soul. Do you agree? We are more than just a soul. So now, Allah gave that body and that body on its own, and it's actually like really that warrior. As I said, Nam, it is strong. It says, I want to survive, I want to defend. Nam, and that's the alpha male in you that says, why does he have more than me? Nam, because it's all about survival. Somebody having more than you, that's dangerous. It was dangerous, it's no longer dangerous. Now, if it was dangerous, then I would have been dead by now <laughs> just by looking at the account of Elon Musk, for example. So Nam, if, if, if you're going to have a look, so everything was about me and about, about the body and survival and if people are, are stronger than me, then I'm jealous and if people are stronger than me, I will gossip about them because I have to ensure that I survive. So we have that limbic system where all the, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. So please, I'm not teaching neurology, neurosciences and neuroplasticity, that's not the goal. So I'm oversimplifying this here. So we have a part in the brain that is created to what? To survive. It comes with the basic instincts and emotions. Now, it's, it's our sexual drive, the drive to, to be strong, the drive to have more, the drive, any lost passions, you want to eat, you want to drink. That is what it's created for. But it was only created to do this, now, to serve the soul. But now it started dragging the soul with it because the body was nourished and the soul wasn't. Are you still with me? So it comes into that body and now there is that fight going on. The soul at the very beginning says, I want my Lord, I want my Lord. But nobody taught her how to fight the basic desires. Nobody taught her how to use that body to be put at service of Allah Jalla wa ala subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what was going on now? You have a soul that wants to go back to Allah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We come from Allah and to Him we return. But now how do I handle this body. How do I do that? No. So that is where the conflict with ourselves actually came into existence. And then we had the frontal lobe. That was our rational self. Now our rational self is here. That's not the soul. Now, so the rational self was all about, okay, I have emotions, let me rationalize my emotions. Because if you go so solely by your basic instincts that were God-given, now, to please him, not to rebel against him. Now, then you are no different from an animal. 
Now, if you just go merely solely by basic instincts, I want, I have a sexual drive, I want to eat, I want drink, I want more, I want money. Look at all the people in the world, the majority of leaders that are killing day and night. They're just going by basic instincts, not even by rationale. They can't rationalize, they try to rationalize what they're doing, but they know it's, it, it's evil. So when you are left to your basic instincts, then you don't use your rationale, and then you will be like an animal with the sole difference that an animal is never, never evil. Now, if it follows its instincts, that, that's what it's created for. And that's why Allah says in Surah Al-Teen, He says, يعني, We have created mankind يعني, in the best of shapes and forms. Perfect. And what does He say after that? ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ Then we, uh, سافلين, we brought him back to the lowest of lowest. What is that? That's the human being only solely living on his basic instincts. But Alhamdulillah, Allah knew that not everybody would be a Muslim, so He gave us the rationale. So that we would be, be different from animals. That's the moral compass that the majority of people have. Then people say, then what about LBGTQ for example? Where does that come in? Well, it's to the rational brain, now not the Muslim brain, it's just I am my body. So I am myself my, and I do with my body what I want as long as I do not oppress others. As long as everything is with consent. But the other part of the rational brain that, that designed the, uni the, the universal rights of the human beings, whatever it may be called. Yani, so if you're going to have a look at that, it was no stealing, not, not taking somebody else's property, no sex without consent. I, that's not all in, in, the, in the declaration of the universal. Uh, but I'm just saying, so people when they use their rationale, they come to a point where they say, we are not allowed to oppress others. We have to do things with consent. We are not allowed to steal. We are not allowed to, to cheat. We are not allowed to do this. We are not allowed to do that. But then we have the soul. And the soul is taught by the Sharia. So a basic instinct that says, I have a sexual drive and I don't care. Whether it's with my wife or I'm married and I have a girlfriend on top of that, I don't, I don't mind. It's just my instinct and I go by it. The rationale says, well, I have, a, I have that instinct, but I can't cheat on my wife. Or it says, I don't have a wife, so I have a girlfriend. Because it is with consent and the, 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 the rationale doesn't make up a sharia. But then the sharia comes. And the sharia teaches the soul. And it says, look, the only one you are allowed to do that with is your own wife or your own husband. You are not allowed, even when you're not married, you're not allowed to have a girlfriend. So that is the third dimension. So we have basic instinct. Then we have frontal lobes, but, yeah, oversimplified. And which, which teaches me, I want money. Basic instinct. I like that. Bam, I steal it. I steal land. No? I steal land. Very, very actual. Uh, since 1945 or before that. Yani, I steal land. Uh, I bombard innocent people because I want some more oil. That's not here. That is that yani, survival mode that is disconnected from your human side. Not your spiritual side, your human side. So I want money, I do everything for money. And then you have the rationale says, look, I cannot steal from people. So let me do some nice euro millions. But always while using my mind once a week, four pounds per week, now, or it's more, I don't know. And I don't hurt anybody. And alhamdulillah, I don't, I don't know, yeah, Muslims do it as well. So, uh, and alhamdulillah, even the money that I invest in it, a part of it goes to people in need. Now, a part of what you spend, so don't do it, right? I'm not saying it's good. So, it goes to um, di disabled people, to the blind, to uh, cancer, whatever. So, that's not bad. Because rationally, I'm not hurting anybody. It's not the same as being addicted. So, now money, look. Basic instinct, I get money the way I want. This part here says, not the way I want, but a nice little euro millions or asking a bit of riba, not, or yani, alone with riba is okay. And then comes the Sharia. It says, no. Sharia says, uh -uh. you are not allowed to do this or that. The only way to make money is that way. So the Sharia is the language of the soul and the rationale and is there to tame the basic instincts and emotions. Without Sharia, we still have our humanity, but that can be erased. That is the fitrah that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about, that you know right from wrong. 
Now, even when you're very small, you steal a candy from, the ki- from your own kitchen and you know your mother doesn't want you to take a, a candy, you're going to look, why do you feel like that? Nobody told you this. You feel bad because it goes against what? This here. So anyway, I'm just going to drink some water. Is everything clear so far? Are we sure? SubhanAllah, Allah created us so perfectly. So let's continue. So then we come to sin. What is a sin? A sin is answering your basic instincts in a way that the Sharia does not approve of. Ah. Who can repeat this? A sin is answering Thank you very much. your basic instincts now, in a way that the Sharia does not approve of. So the difference between a sin is not always the action. And then I mean at the rational point of you, not the basic. So the difference between a sin and a worship is very often the way in which you answer the call. So for example, intimacy. Zina is intimacy, right? It is that sexual drive that is within the body. Now, if I answer that call in a haram way, that is then haram. But if I do it in a way of sharia, it's even worship. Do you see? The same eating and drinking. I eat and drink. Now, so some people say, um, I eat and drink. Uh, if I just listen to my basic instinct, I eat and drink your food. If it's here, I eat and drink healthy things, whatever. And then sharia comes and teaches you what to eat and what not to eat. So if you're going to have a look, so even, eat, eat, uh, even eating, Eating pork is not a bad thing to my brain. But the Sharia says don't. So the difference now between sinning while eating and not sinning is what? Is what you eat. It's not eating. And the difference between zina and halal intimacy is not what you do. It is with whom you do it. So all these drives, if we use them well, then we will worship Allah. And we will not have to shut down our basic instincts and basic emotions. But we just need to know how to channel them. So the difference between a sin and not a sin is knowing how to channel these emotions and these drives. Are we still clear? Okay. Do you have a question? Oh, I feel so sorry for you on a Friday evening. Like you've been working all day and then you have this uh, strange man. Yes, and sins and souls and basic instincts. And uh, sometimes we just have to do it. Is it clear? Alhamdulillah. Yes. Yes. Our yes. Yes. So that is why that some say the ego or the carnal self is that very old part in your brain that just wants you to survive. And the wanting to survive is the strongest thing. It's the strongest emotion that you can have. So they say that every illness or every disease, spiritual disease, is a result of wanting to survive without using your brain properly or the Sharia. Hatred, why? Because you feel threatened. Curiosity, wanting to know everything that's going on in the world, why? Because that was needed, because not knowing what is about to happen threatens you. So we are a system that is ajib. So some say that all of the spiritual diseases like jealousy, like Gossip. Why do you gossip? Because if you gossip about that person, he's not, no longer as important as you are. And that gives you a secure position within society. If you have a lot of money, same thing. If you have, if your honor and your held in high esteem, same thing. So that's why some say it all goes back to the nefs and the nefs would be that mechanism that Allah has designed for you to survive. But you just have to tame it with the sharia. That's it. And if you take it with the Sharia, you don't have that problem. So now let's continue. So, bi'ithnillahi azza wa jalla, I have some slides here. Um, they were sin? Or, yeah. Allah. SubhanAllah, this is also why sometimes we feel that we are between an, an angelic self and a demonic one. Huh? 
So the demonic one, the human being is not intrinsically bad. Meaning, you, the human being is not bad. There is no evil in you. The evil is that you do not know how to control, tame, and temper certain emotions. Are you with me? But intrinsically, you're not bad. Allah didn't create you as a bad being. Allah created you with love and care. And He loves you. But then we have two things that change who you are. One of them is nurture. Nurture, that's what the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. We have nature and nurture. Nature are the genes that are passed on. And that is a part of who we are. And then you have nurture. That is what you have seen. That is what you have heard. What you have experienced in your life. You absorb that. Even when you think that your children, when they're one and a year and a half old and you're fighting with your wife, for example, they absorb that. And that will also shape their character. That will shape who they are and how they will respond to a fight later on when they grow old, older. So nurture is like the... Anyway, nurture is through school, religious institutions, culture, and your house. These are the four most important yani, shapers. School, your house, culture, and religious institution. It's the institutions. And that is that takes away your fitrah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, yani, Kullu yuladu ala fitrah. Every human being is born with the fitrah. What is the fitrah? The fitrah is the natural inclination towards goodness and God, Almighty Allah. That is your fitrah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, and then his parents turn him into a Christian or into a Jew or into anything else. And that is what society is doing. Society is taking us away from the fitrah. So, yani, to come back, how did we come to the fitrah? No, nurture. So that's, the, that's one, one thing. And then you see, it's, it's subhanAllah, that we, our souls, our bodies have been nourished more than our souls since we were young. So what happens, a lot of dust, layers of dust are covering the soul. And we started living in that modus where it's all about the physical. Even if you're not a bad being, you have your rationale, you, you're a good human being. And that's why we say non-Muslims can be, can be, without a T, getting good human beings. Because with their brain, they hold on to human values. But they're not good servants of Allah. Because they do not live for the soul. Are you with me? So that's why some non-Muslims are better human beings than Muslims in their behavior, in the way they act. But they're not better slaves to Allah. Are you with me? Because the biggest sin is not recognizing a Lord none, and a master that has created you and has a right over you. But that's where people sometimes you know, uh, end up in a state of panic. They say, how can you say that a non-Muslim is a better human being than a Muslim? Now, in their outward actions, they are. I've seen, like I said, my, my grandmother, she turned 97 and then she embraced Islam. For 19, 97 years, and I am not lying or exaggerating, she was an atheist. I never knew her lying. She was never too late. She, when she forgave, she never spoke about it ever again. When she would come, she was on time. She would be a minute or five minutes early, and then she would wait in front of the door until it was 12 sharp. She said, because coming too early is like coming too late. If you come too early, people are not ready, and if you come too late, people are stressed. So subhanAllah, yani she was a kafira, somebody who refuses to believe in Allah for 97 years. And that was her behavior. I learned more from my grandmother than from the Muslims. Apart from the Prophet and, and the ulama. Now, and I saw a lot of good Muslims, by the way, who changed my life. So that was a bit radical of me to say this. No, that's not true. That, no, Allah, it's not true. So I've seen many good Muslims I've, I've, I've learned from. So just to cut a long story short, my, my, my grandmother would wake up with me uh, in, in uh, summer times to make my Sahur. She would wake up for, for Ramadan in Ramadan at 3.30. When I would spend the night there, 3.30 she would be cooking. And I said, subhanAllah, she wakes up in a time where Muslims don't wake up for Fajr. 
And she wakes up for her grandson to make food so that he can fast. But while in a time where people may not even wake up for Fajr. So, once again, it is a blessing of Allah that He didn't just create us with these basic instincts. Imagine that we were all like animals. Now, meaning not like animals, animals are good. And that we would just, that would be our drive and we would not know a rational thinking. So Allah knew that not everybody would be Muslim. So by logical thinking, they came as close as they could to designing a world on paper. Now, uh, yani, as close as they could to the fitrah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where everything needs to be with consent and where you can't yani, abuse or where you can't yani, uh, oppress people. So it's a ni'mah of Allah that we have that moral compass. Khalas? Okay. So now, Allah, uh, I, have it, I have it in, uh, I have it in English, uh, in Dutch. So we have Ruh and Nafs. Okay. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Let us continue. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, yes. No. Uh, Waswasa can come from two, two things. It's either from the self or either from shaitan. Um, and the self yani, can be obsessive. Um, and that, that's because, because of many reasons that I can't explain now. Mm. 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 No. Um, our scholars say that every heart has an opening and um, shaitan places he, his trunk on that opening to give waswasa so when the heart was removed from the prophet's body والسلام, it was to close that opening so waswasa never took place in the life of the prophet so, um, and subhanAllah, when people used to read this, like maybe 100 years ago, the atheists would say like, wow, that's impossible. How can a heart be removed? This is what heart surgeons sometimes do. They literally remove your heart from your body and then they replace it and you, you still live. Um, so if, if a human, be human beings can do it, then uh, and Allah and his angels and he can definitely do it as well. So, one question per person, if that's okay. Yes, in the back, please. Mm. So we have three nufus, right? An nafsul amara to be so, an nafsul lawama. So the nafsul amara to be so is the person that only listens to his basic instincts and emotions. Now it's al amara be so. It always tells him to do bad things, meaning to channel his or her desires in a way that Allah doesn't approve of. The nafsul lawana is the one that is between the basic instinct and the rationale. It knows it shouldn't have done it, but it, feel it, it does it anyway. And the nafsul mutma'inna is where the rationale and the basic emotions are in line with the sharia at all times. And that is the only way to find peace in your mind, in your heart, and in your body. It is, and you come to a point when you do not give in to those instincts in a bad way, that eventually your soul will come to the surface. So the reason for the soul not to take over the body is because you still give too much importance to your body. But at a certain point, listen to this alam saying, for 30 years, I've been dragging myself to pray at night. 30 years, I've been dragging myself to pray at night. He said, and now after 30 years, my body is dragging me to pray at night. And that's what Allah says in the Quran, فَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعَ It is their own bodies that now refuse to sleep. Because now the body serves its purpose. The body was not created to go against the soul. The body was created to what? To serve it. But if the person riding the horse does not know how to tame it, he will be thrown off by the horse. And the same with bulls. You can sit on a bull and it throws you off in not even in a split of a second but other people they just keep on sitting and they don't fall off so and that's the same because the body is a very strong mechanism but it's not a bad one but if we now refuse to give in 
to the deviant urges, or no, to express these urges in a deviant way, then all of a sudden now the soul has time to grow. So the reason why you do not experience the presence of the soul in your body is because you give in too much to your body. So, how are you going to fight this then? Now, uh, go ahead, please. Yes. 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 Mm. So in, in Jannah, the bodies, they, they don't have the digestive, digestive system. They're not in need of everything that we are in need of now in order to survive and live. And that's why oxygen, for example, this is how weak we are. Our existence depends on something we cannot see. Hey, you suck away the, the, the air from this room and we all die. What happened? We just, boom, dead. SubhanAllah. So in, in Jannah, that's not the case. In Jannah, that's not the case. So our existence does no longer depend on something external or internal. None. So internal meaning, blood flow, resp uh, respiration, uh, pumping of the heart, whatever it may be. So we need that to stay alive. And nothing external, meaning if not, I'm in need of space to live. Right? So if, if the space becomes become smaller, I die. If somebody kills me, I die. So there is no external threat nor an internal necessity or requirement to stay alive in Jannah. We are alive because of Al-Hayy. Because of the living. Jalla wa ala subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there, yani, our life no longer depends on anything that Allah has created as a means to stay alive. We live because of His choice to live. Not through any means. Because there we are, th that's the reward of Tawheed. And the Tawheed is that you depend solely on Allah Jalla wa ala. So in Jannah, that is the realization of that Tawheed. Where your living and even your breathing is dhikr. Like the Prophet said, yani you will breathe dhikr like you breathe air here. And that's not for the lungs. And that's why the Prophet said, people in Jannah don't use the toilet. People in Jannah, in paradise, do not use wind. People in Jannah, their sweat is musk. Because when we sweat now, it's to cool the body. And we always think we sweat because it's hot, but actually, yes, but we sweat to cool the body. That's what it does. That's that beautiful system that Allah has created. So subhanAllah, it's, it's entirely different. In Jannah, things grow with kun, be, and it is. Not through rain. Not through sun. Because Allah says in the Quran, لَا يَرَوْنَ فِيهَا شَمْسَ In Jannah, they will not see sun. So there is light without a means to give light. Because Allah Jalla wa Ala, here, yani, we look at Allah through the means He has given, but there we stare and we gaze upon Allah. So it's entirely different there. So we don't need sleep. Here we need sleep. If you don't sleep, sleep deprivation drives you mad. Sleep deprivation drives you mad and can eventually kill you. Um, that is why it has been used, even though that it's not permissible, um, that you sign something under distress, like um, sleep deprivation and other things. But this is what the CIA and others still practice. So, and that's why the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, ayyanamu ahlul jannah. O Messenger of Allah, do the people of Jannah sleep? He said, annawmu ahlul mawt wa ahlul jannati la yamutun. He says, sleep is... Yani the, the brother of de death and the people of Jannah just don't die. The people of Jannah do not die. Yani they do not cease. Yani. So this is why it is entirely different. Now, uh, even our skins, yani in Jannah it's not like him. Now, our skins renew all the time. There it will be different. So we will have bodies that will resemble up to a certain level who we are now. It would be like, for example, if I would appear in front of you now, how I was like... 27 years ago, when I was 20. And I would appear in front of you, you say, SubhanAllah, it looks like somebody I know. Now, you say, SubhanAllah, you remind me of somebody. And that is exactly what happened to the wife of Yusra, alayhi salam. Like in the story, when, when he was cured by Allah, his wife went out and she came back. And she found her husband cured. So he, was, he looked younger and healthier. And she said, you remind me so much of my husband. 
and he remained silent. She said, if I wouldn't know better, I would think you were my husband when he was young. And then he said, I am indeed your, your husband and Allah has cured me. And then Allah Jalla wa'ala poured uh, 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 over him any grasshoppers, uh, locusts made out of gold. And then he started uh, taking these locusts and filling his pockets with it. And then Allah Jalla wa'ala said, are you greedy? He said, as far as your mercy is concerned, yes, my Lord. And that's a sound hadith, yani sahih hadith, in a sahih. So as you see, Barakallahu Feekum, yani Jannah is, is in... Huh? Ayyub, Ayyub, what did I say? Oh no, it's wrong, no, it's Ayyub, it's Ayyub. Yeah, yeah, it's good you corrected me. So of course it's Ayyub. So if you're going to see Barakallahu Feekum, it's, it's amazing. Yani how, how things, Barakallahu Feekum, yani are different in Jannah. So the people of Jannah, they have no hasad. And because surviving is no longer necessary, because you will not, not be threatened. Now, so everything is different. They say just hugging your wife, or if you're a woman, your husband, just the hug is 40 years. <laughs> yeah, subhanAllah. Like 40 years, hi, how are you? Oh, yani absorb the love. Now, so that's just hugging. Ah, what about Hulayn? <laughs> Look, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. I, I gave my wife a wedding ring for the Akhirah. So one was for this life, and then I gave her another one where I said, I distanced myself from the Hurul Ayn. I just want you. Because of everything she means to me, and everything she's done for me, and even if that would not you know, make her sad there, I, I don't want it. You're, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to want it, right? Like, oh, you don't want There is much better in Jannah. Why, why would I want if you can look at Allah. Now, I, I think some of these things, we are of different levels, and I'm, not, I'm of the lowest level, so don't, I'm not trying to, 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 to say something to the contrary of what I've just said. But you, you can, in Jannah, you can want rivers, you can want castles of, of, of honey, uh, sorry, castles of diamond and gold and silver. It's just more dunya. That's for the people of the right hand. Is that when, when they think of Jannah, they say, oh, and I'm not meaning you, Habib, yeah? They say, Hur al -ayn, yay. They say, castles of diamond and gold and silver. Again, yay, with my Hur al -ayn. And then swimming in the rivers of milk and honey with the Hur al -ayn. So, yani, Hur al -ayn are the women in Jannah. So, this is what people think of. It's just, it looks just like what people are doing today, but in a halal way, because it's in Jannah. Which is not wrong. It's not wrong, it's okay. But if you can have more, why do you go for less? And you can gaze upon Allah all the time. So why would you like to go back to a thousand of Hur al -ayn when you just go back to one wife? You say, Habibti, everything okay? Remember the days in dunya, salama, go back to Allah. And subhanAllah, you just, I mean, that's the life. Naam. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I, no, we don't, we don't have to want it, Sidi. Why do you force Hur al -ayn upon me? Allah Jalla. <laughs> Every, everything is written. <laughs> everything is with consent, Sidi. <laughs> so, so Sidi, look. <laughs> so Sidi, look. Allah says Himself in the Quran, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَةِ وَزِيَادًا For those who excel in good, there is good and more. Why would I go for good if I can go for more? It's a personal choice. It's okay. There is good and more. Yes, but <laughs> Habibi, if you want your hulayn, you will have them. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Inna ja'alnahunna abkara uruban atraba li ashabi al yameen. Wa lam yaqul lil mutasabiqin. Because it's okay, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, Allah <laughs> Yarzuk. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina. Yes. yes. SubhanAllah, they say, like Imam al Dhamiyati, Rahimahullah, mentioned the hadith in his uh, book, Al Majar al Rabih. And the hadith is Hassan al Ghayrihi. Where the Prophet said, The Nahr, the dowry of Hur al Ain, is Qiyam al Layl. 
And that every time, that's in the hadith, when you do qiyam al-layl, they come in the invisible world, world down to surround the one praying and they are all fighting to be the first one you would go to. Does that make you happy? No. You want another one? Another one? And Aisha radiallahu anha has said, like Imam al-Jurdani he was a Shafi'i scholar in his book, Fatih al-Alam, in the Muqaddimah, in the introduction to his book, he said that uh, when the people, the women of Jannah come to Jannah, Duhur al-Ain will come. Duhur al-Ain, and they say, Nahmu radiyat. They said, we are those who've always been content, and sometimes you became angry. Nahmu shabbat, we are the, yani we are the, I'm sorry, we are the youngsters, we never grew old. They say we are beautiful, we never lost our beauty. So this horse that gets the, the women of Jannah going, right? Like, whoa, take it easy, hold your horses. And then Aisha radiallahu anha said, and then I will speak. And she says, نَحْنُ السَّاجِدَاتِ وَمَا سَجَدْتُمْنَا We perform sujood you never did. نَحْنُ الصَّائِمَاتِ we did so and you never did so. نَحْنُ mutahajjibat. We did wear hijab, you never did. And then she says, and then the Hur al Ain, submit to the women of what? Of dunya. So the women of dunya, they have a value that the Hur al Ain will never have. Never. So. Yes. Really? I don't know what the question was. <laughs> ah, subhanAllah, Allah Akbar. Yeah, that's a coincidence. So, is it clear? I don't know how we got into Hur al-Ain there. <laughs> like, uh, it's like a hot topic. <laughs> if you want, I know the hadith, I can describe it to you. <laughs> So yes, yes please. Sorry, can we listen to the question please? Yes. No, look, looking at Allah, I was gonna say, SubhanAllah, looking at Allah, the amount you will be looking at Allah is in line with the amount you want to see Him here with your heart. So the more you seek His nearness here, the more He will seek yours there. So when you, how do you know whether you seek him, you search for him and you want him? Just look at your nights. If your nights are filled with dedication, submission, tears and cheers out of joy of being with him, then know that you have not chosen him, but know that he has chosen you to be his friend during the night. So, yani in harmony, in line, with your searching Allah in this life, you will be more gazing upon Him in the next. It's a very beautiful thing. So some of the people, they only have one day off, and that's on Jum'ah. So in Jum'ah, the Prophet ﷺ said on Jum'ah, Friday, when they're in Jannah, they go to the aswaq, they go to the markets, and the women, they are at home. So the women do the groceries, right? They, they shop. So subhanAllah, I think we still think that we are like these cavemen when we come back from the shop today. Like back in the days when you wanted to impress your wife, you would come back with food. <laughs> so you would hunt, you would risk your life, you would come back with a tiger or whatever. Of course, you were then not following a madhab. That was before the Prophet ﷺ, so you came back with a tiger or a hyena, if you're a chef, eh? that's okay. So you would come back anyway. So, so you would come back and then the entire village would look at you hero who risked his life to feed us and now when we come back to little uh, from little we experience <laughs> we, we still have that process going on of want to be admired because we are carrying two bags but the majority of men just send their own lives to little now so back in the days yani, if you wanted food you were risking your life now if you want food you just drive your car and, and you're, you know, you're angry because you're in a traffic jam or because they're out of milk or during COVID out of toilet paper so now to come back, where were we? So they go to this market 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, and then there is a breeze that gently yani, touches their faces. And through this, they shine more than ever before. When they then, then return to their wives, then they say like, wow, you've become so much more beautiful. But they will be illuminated through your face. And I will come back to a hadith. Then it will be illuminated through your face uh, by means of which they are more beautiful than when you left them. And you say, you too, you became so much more beautiful. So that attraction, now like you had when the first time you saw each other, and that slowly fades away. Not that you don't like your wife or your husband anymore, but it's not that same like, you know, that you're starstruck, for example. You will be starstruck all the time. Every Juma, it looks like she has, you know, her husband has been renewed and your wife has been renewed, not a new husband and new wife. So subhanAllah, that's the beauty. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and the lower levels of Jannah are enlightened by the faces of those who live above them. Uh, in the Jannah of Imam Suyuti, in the Hadith is Hassan. Yani some of, yani the people of the lower yani degrees in paradise, their paradise is not enlightened by the sun, but by the brilliant, radiant, illuminate, illuminated faces of the people who live above them. They are like the sun, what, like what the sun is to us. Because remember, the difference between two levels in paradise is like we and the furthest star away. So we will shine upon them if we are in a higher level. Yes, sir. So yeah, Jannah is different. And then the, the biggest thing in Jannah, you know, that is, that is some people will reside in Jannah with archangels. Jibreel, Mikael, and Israfil. Some of the people, they will be so high that they will reside in Jannah with Jibreel. And Mikael and Israfil. And they are the people of the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الماهر بالقرآن مع السفر الكرام البررة والذي يقرأ القرآن وهو يتتعتع فيه وهو عليه شاق وأجرا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, الماهر بالقرآن, an expert of the Quran, will be مع السفر, the ambassadors, الكرام, the honourable, البررة, the righteous, and the angels. Not in this life, this scholar say. But the, he will be with the angels, yani in paradise in the next. Why? Because Jibreel came with the wahd and he passed on the wahd. Yani because Jibreel came with revelation and the people of the Quran, yani they share that revelation. So that's why their yani reward is the same. Or rather, their reward is being with the angels because the angels are not rewarded. They just reside in paradise. So the people of the Quran, Yani they are Ahlullah. The Prophet said, Allah has chosen ones amongst these people. And they said, Whom are they, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Whom Ahlul Quran? Whom Ahlullah wa Khasafuhu min khalqihi? They are the people of the Quran. They are Allah's chosen ones. And they are Allah's family. Imam Munawi says in Fayl Qadir, Allah's family doesn't mean they're connected to Him in any shape or form like families are. Yani he treats them like you treat your family in the best of ways. So the people of the Qur'an, yani they are elevated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, ثُمَّ أُرَثْنَا الْكِتَابِ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا We have yani, chosen amongst our servants those whom we made inherit the book. So what is inheriting the book? That you memorize the entire Qur'an. And that you pray with it during the night. And that you practice or teach it during the day. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَا حَسَدَ إِلَّا فِتْنَتَيْنِ don't be jealous unless it's of two people. And this is yani, a positive jealousy. He says, Rajul, Quran. A man can be a woman that was given the Quran by Allah. So he is the one who prays with it during the night and teaches it during the day. That's one you may be jealous of in a good way. And the second one is a man or woman with a lot of money. It's a man or a woman yani that have a lot of money, loads of money, but they spend it until nothing of it is left for them. Meaning that if you're jealous of somebody with money, then it makes no sense. 
you should envy the person who has money and spends it until nothing is left. If that is not the case, then there's no reason wanting to have what somebody else has. We don't say money doesn't make life easier. Of course it does. But it doesn't make your hasanat bigger. It can make it bigger or smaller. So you don't need money to have hasanat. No? So if you want a happy life, you have the hasana life. If you want a pleasant life, you have a money life. But that doesn't make you happy. Money is not a guarantee for happiness. No. But intrinsic happiness with Allah Jalla wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is without any doubt. That's why you can find the people who are close to Allah, they can live under a bridge and they're still happy. Because believe me, if you still have Allah, what have you lost? And if you don't have Allah, what have you gained? That's what life's about. It's the quest for more Allah in our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we went from this to that, to Jannah, to Hur al-Ain. Hur al but as I said, it's not haram to want Hur al-Ain. Nobody says that, right? It's not bad to want it. It can be a personal choice. You don't have to want it. You understand what I mean? So, and it's, it's not that every man should tell his wife, I don't want Hur al-Ain just to please her. It's Allah gave you. Naam? So you're allowed to accept it. Um, for me, it's more a sign of loyalty to what yani, a wife does for her husband, husband really. And it's not wrong, it's not haram, it's not despicable, it's not horrifying, um, it's not nothing bad. But once again, why would you like to go to a thousand? Taking that away, you away from Allah, why you can just go to one and go back to Allah? For me that's sufficient. And everybody has his own thing. We may a lot of Torah, please. <laughs> May Allah bless you. Does anybody have a question about it? Do you have any questions? So I hope that a lot of it can sink in and that you will absorb it because next week we will build on it. And he was first, sorry. I thought that. No. That's a saying, but it's not a hadith. No. So everything which is a saying, especially about the ghayb, the world of the unseen. You, you, can, you, you cannot come with things about the unseen on your own because there is no revelation to you. So they may say that, but um, yani, everybody will be allowed to look at Allah, Jalla wa Allah, men and women alike. That may be true, but it, the one doesn't yani, uh, exclude the other. Yes, yes. Some say when you visit, you don't leave your own Jannah. Meaning that if you visit, that, that because Allah says that people of the same family will be together in Jannah, right? But some will have more hasanat. Maybe your wife will have more hasanat than you, or you than your wife, or you than your children, and your children than you. So will I then always be separated from my children? Your children will have the same age as you have. So they won't call you, Dad, come here. You know? <laughs> Dad, I'm hungry. And go and walk for 500 years. There is a nice tree with an apple tree. That's how long it takes, right? 700 years walking in the shade of a tree. That's if you don't ride a horse. If you ride your horse, it's only 100 years. So not to come back. So they say that you will perceive your gender while you are in their gender. So going lower doesn't mean losing out on your state. Because Allah can create whatever He wants. Now, so I am still in the luxury of my Jannah and they perceive their own Jannah when they look at me. But I see something entirely different. So that nobody is ever now, uh, experiencing any sadness because there is no sadness in Jannah. Now. So if I am in Jannah, visit me down. So. Yes. Mm. That, that's a very good thing and that is what we are going to investigate next week inshallah. So the scholars, they have extensively written on this matter and they disagree. Some say qalb is ruh and nafs is aql. And so they really did, you know, have differed a lot upon it. But inshallah next week, that is what we are going to talk about. What is the role of the heart? 
within the world or the realm of the soul, of the spiritual? Is it just an organ or is it more than that? Uh, there is a surgeon uh, that wrote about the role of the heart within the emotional realm. It's called The Heart Speaks. I forgot the name of the writer, but it's called The Heart Speaks, a heart surgeon, uh, who yani, then found that the heart literally has emotions. So inshallah, we will speak about that next week. That's the last question for me. Matteo, right? Yes. Um, yes, so they say men will be 33, women will be 27, but they differ about it, but that will be around that age. Uh, they say we will have the... Uh, they, they, there is a narration that says like Adam, and Adam was 30, how much? Not feet, meters. Yeah, yeah. it was in meters. So, um, yeah, we will be tall, but everything will be big, so we won't notice, right? So we won't notice. And that's why Adam was very long. So people say, why didn't Allah mention dinosaurs in the Quran? Well, Allah mentioned yani, animals, and He said some of them walk, some of them fly, some of them go on their, crawl on their belly. Like if Adam existed in the time of the, of the Rex or the dromedary and so forth, it would have been a pit bull. Now, the drama, any one of them would be his horse and the other one would be his little dog. You, you understand what I mean? So, it would, that, that's the way. I'm not saying they lived in the same time, the Jurassic, this and that, I don't know. But, um, I mean, that is how tall we will be, inshallah. Inshallah, I'm going to, uh, it's time almost for the Adhan, isn't it? Okay, who's making the Adhan? Um, I, I don't know who gives the Adhan. I, I don't decide. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة Sunnah is um, that uh, we, we, 
Because it's not the clock that decides how long you pray. At what time you pray. So even if an imam were to come two minutes late, for example, because maybe you have to leave the doors or whatever, people don't have to say like, oh, on the clock it's time. I mean, there are many things. I'm not talking about you. Okay. استغوا اعتدلوا توجهوا بقلوبكم إلى الله عز وجل وصلوا صلاة مودع الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا عسى ربكم أن يرحمكم وإن عدتم عدنا وجعلنا جهنم للكافرين حصيرا 